What's up guys? Welcome back to the channel BC coming at you with all the latest in the pro wrestling world for this morning at least Friday August 30th 2024 just 24 hours away from Bash in Berlin from World Wrestling Entertainment. BC hopes to be live with you guys during that event. So while Bash in Berlin is taking place stop by the channel even if only for a moment Say what's up to BC and the unit. Smash that up. Show that support. We'd love to have you. Nobody does reviews in pro wrestling in this community like we do. We got the good, the bad, and the ugly review. All's that I got the board ready. All that's missing is a tally. Every single match is going to go in one of these columns tomorrow. So we're going to light this board up. And every match will be placed in one of those columns. When the event is over, we're going to find out if Bash in Berlin was good, bad, or ugly. And we're going to do that live during the event. Super excited for that. Hopefully you guys can join. Now let's get into the news for today. Again, as of this morning, Friday, August 30th, Nikki Cross has re-signed with WWE. She is staying a part of the WWE family. Thus... She will be a pivotal part going forward of this Wyatt faction. I find it very interesting that WWE and Becky Lynch have yet to come to terms, right? We already know that some copies have been sent to Becky Lynch, some drafts, and she has rejected them. Maybe she wants some things taken out, some things added in, but something isn't clicking. And to our knowledge, as of yet, Becky and WWE have not signed a contract. It's imminent but there's still I's that need to be dotted and T's that need to be crossed. But one cross that there's no question mark is Nikki Cross. She has re-signed with WWE. Natalia, we believe, has already as well. Uh, Becky Lynch would be the, the last of the big ladies that still needs to be re-signed. This is the WWE way now. Instead of just doing mass releasings where the company looks really bad, they're letting contracts expire 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 you ever see that commercial <laughs> the grandma's going through the fridge and everything in the fridge is expired so she's throwing food away the parents are like what are you that's money expire expire that's what wwe is doing though right they're waiting till contracts expire and then they're like we don't know if we're gonna resign you they don't even care who you are or how big you think you are or your name value if they think they can take a few million dollars off the books, they're gonna. We saw it with Bobby Lashley, just saw it with Ricochet. Uh, they let Dijak's contract run out and booted him. It's, it's happening a lot, and Becky Lynch is not a shoe-in. A lot of people think, oh, that's just, she's obviously coming back. Seth is there, it's Becky Lynch, the name value. WWE's new way to do business, if, if they can save three to five million dollars, <laughs> which is what a new Becky Lynch contract would probably be, especially that Mercedes just cashed in on five mil. And she was already getting, Becky was getting already three to four. You got to believe three to five is going to be that new offer. If they can take those millions off the books, you got to remember the Endeavor flywheel, right? Where they wanted to recoup 50 million from UFC and they did that successfully. You got to believe 75 to 100 million is what, Endeavor would like to recoup for WWE's flywheel. And this is the way to do it. It has to come off the books and contracts with the talent. So that, that's, a, that's a deeper conversation for another day. But, you know, Becky is not a shoe in necessarily, even though several times we thought all that needed to be done was those I's dotted, those T's crossed, and boom, we're going to hear the announcement. But Becky, something isn't clicking. Maybe it is the money. Maybe she wants more, and WWE's like, it's a different business now, man. <laughs> you know, Endeavor, Endeavor is saying this is the cap. Just can't do it. So we'll find out. But Nikki Cross is indeed back. Not that she went anywhere. Was she on Raw? I, I thought she was missing from Raw, but some talents were on tour, like the champion Gunther and, and many others. So maybe she was just on tour, or maybe they were like, listen, we don't even know if you're going to be with us in two weeks. You sit home until we finalize this contract. But I don't remember seeing Nikki Cross as part of the Wyatts on Raw. Well, either way, she'll be a part of it going forward. Nikki Cross resigns. Um, also, uh, switching over to AEW, AEW Dynamite. We went over every other rating in the company this week. Monday Night Raw scored a 1-7 Semod. 
Uh, SmackDown went down to a 205, 49,000 away from going under 2 million on Fox. Wow. And then NXT scored, I believe, 615,000. AEW scored for this week's Dynamite, not 600, 691,000 viewers. 691 down from last week, 698. So they went down 7,000 viewers. That's the good news, not a big drop. The bad news, it's a drop on your post all-in show. Uh, the post shows are usually where you see a big spike in the ratings. A lot of people that didn't watch the pay-per-view, they want to find out what happened, and they want to find out for free. They don't want to have to pay for it, so they're going to go check out Dynamite. Um, and somehow they went down 7,000 from the go-home show to all-in. So 691, not sure. I was not able to see Dynamite in totality. The segments I saw, I, I liked. <laughs> I thought they were well done. We're, after Ricochet's match and Osprey showed up and you had the stare down, but the bastard back came out and absolutely flipped the segment and Osprey upside down on their dome piece. I thought that was so well done and, and pack. As short of the words were, they were more impactful than anything pack has said in the last several years. The line delivery so well done. This this one is mine. You you get in line. And you set up so many feuds with that, right? Pac and Ricochet, Osprey, Ricochet, Pac, Osprey. You got like three or four feuds just in that one little three-minute post-match segment. I thought that was well done. I was able to catch that live. Um, Brian Danielson's uh, retirement speech, a lot of people thought, but instead he said the time is not now. That led to Jack Perry on the Tron and then eventually behind Brian Danielson. I thought that was well done. And a lot of the community is befuddled that we're getting Jack Perry and Brian Danielson for his first title defense two weeks after All In in Chicago All Out. I'm totally fine with it. So maybe that's where there's a disconnect. Where a lot of fans are like, that's that's not it. And BC's like, no, that's it. It's Chicago. Jack Perry is going to be one of the loudest boos, man. It's going to be like Dominic Mysterio going out there and he can't even say a word. You're hoping that's the atmosphere tenfold for Jack Perry. So you put him in the most, most heated situation. You put him right in there with Brian Danielson. You put him in the main event. You let him catch all that heat. And it's no harm, no foul. It's two weeks after Danielson won the, the title. If is done correctly, Perry should be looking up at the lights. And Danielson is off to the races. So look at it more like an exhibition more than a title match. But for some reason, a lot of the community just flipped out when this match was made. Well, where is that same <laughs> where's that same energy when you get a random Cody Rhodes Kevin Owens match? Or even Randy going from SmackDown to Raw and going against Gunther out of nowhere because two months ago he had his shoulder up and it was never acknowledged. Until Gunther got the title. That's like winning the lottery and the, and the family member that you never talked to, right? For decades, they haven't said a word to you, but you win the lottery and then they come around. They're like, oh, hey, man, we're, we're cousins. Yeah, so you, how are you doing in life? Yeah, you didn't just win like 10 million, did you? Because <laughs> I could use a few things. You know, you didn't hear a peep for two months when Randy had the shoulder up and everyone's like, nah, clean victory. Randy's like, eh, it is what it is. And all of a sudden, it, this dude wins the championship and Randy, he's the, he leaves SmackDown with the quickness. <laughs> he shows up on Raw. He's like, ah, oh, man, by the way, remember we had that match months ago? Yeah. Dude, you may not have known this, but my shoulder was up. So, like, can we, like, do it again this time with a title on the line? <laughs> It's odd, man. So there's a lot of odd matchmaking going on. I, you know, you got to keep the same energy with that. Jack Perry in Chicago in the main event to collect all that heat. And I don't believe he should be walking away with that championship. As high as I think Jack Perry, the roller coaster he is on right now is at the peak. And that's good for him and the company. But I just don't see him walking out with the title, nor should he be. But I'm okay with that as well. So the Osprey bastard ricochet thing, the Danielson promo, and the Jack Perry attack, and match set up for All Out. And then, of course, Mox sending shockwaves through the wrestling world, right? Could it be Shane McMahon that's behind this? Or is he just associated with the elite? Or is Mox just starting his own faction? Uh, Marina Shafir joins him. I thought that was, uh, it at least brings some newsworthy discussion to the wrestling world. 
So the parts that I did see is what I'm saying. I thought AEW Dynamite this week was good. But that's the parts I did see. I, I didn't see about an hour and a half of it. So maybe it wasn't good. And that's why they got 691. If you guys caught the show, maybe you know why they somehow lost viewers from last week. And this was the post show. So usually that doesn't happen. But from what I saw, maybe I just got lucky. Not lucky enough to win the lottery, but I got lucky enough to uh, catch some good segments. Dynamite 691, and that concludes all the ratings for this week. So numbers-wise, not a good week for professional wrestling. Raw drops back to 1.7. SmackDown drops all the way to 2.05. And NXT to 6.15. They fell as well. And AEW falls to 691. Uh, moving on, Nikki Bella or Nikki Garcia, right? The twins have separated themselves from WWE. No longer the Bellas. I believe they are the Garcia twins. But for the sake of this upload, keeping it in wrestling talk, if you don't mind, we're just going to call her Nikki Bella. Uh, Nikki Bella's husband arrested for domestic violence. This was just yesterday around 10 a.m., I believe. Um, Artem, and I'm not going to even try. I'm not going to attempt to announce his last name. <laughs> We're just going to call him Artem because that ain't happening. Artem, Nikki Bella, Nikki Garcia's husband has been arrested for domestic violence. Um, this of course led many to believe that it was against Nikki. Because usually domestic violence is within the household, right? Usually it's like a spouse, a partner, so a lot of uh, near, nearly everybody first thought was, oh, Nikki Bella, like it was a fight and it got physical. And but we don't have any confirmation on that. There's been no word on that. In fact, the word we did get is whoever the victim is, uh, they want to remain confidential. So they do not want it known. The, the details, I guess, their identity, they, they don't want any of that out there for the public. So uh, I it, and what makes it even more of an odd thing is Nikki, to this recording anyway, by the time you guys catch this, maybe it'll it'll have changed. But as of this recording, uh, Nikki and her representatives have said nothing. So that doesn't look good either, though. So whatever this, I, I don't know, there, there's a very real possibility that um, this was between Artem and Nikki, and it got so serious uh, that Artem was arrested, domestic violence, and and the people that run the show that Artem was on, Dancing with the Stars, I believe the season 33 was coming up. I, I'm hoping that's accurate, guys. I don't watch the, <laughs> I don't watch the show. Um, but Dancing with the Stars season 33, I believe, is what was coming up. Um, he has gotten Dot's boot. The runners of the show have already released a statement. He will not be returning to the show. So um, he has already been removed from that show. So pretty serious stuff. Uh, we got to find out, you know, hopefully, hopefully Nikki had nothing to do with it. No matter who it was, it's not cool. But hopefully Nikki is is good. Again, we haven't heard any word on her yet. So hopefully she's okay, and hopefully she wasn't even involved in this. So uh, domestic violence, man. Domestic is usually within the... I don't know. That's wild, right? This came right after, like, Nikki, <laughs> Nikki was catching a little bit of heat because she had talked about Mercedes and Baker's match from All In. And we got... You, you guys. We guys. We guys know. You guys. I can speak. You guys know that that match got panned more than any other match this weekend from All In, right? Mercedes and Baker, and I put those two on a pedestal. I think Baker played the perfect centerpiece for a division that was hurting when AEW started and for the years that followed. They really needed somebody in that centerpiece, and I know a lot of fans, they just they don't connect with Britt Baker. I get it. Trust me. But in so many areas, she checked off those boxes, and she truly was a frontline warrior for that company. And you guys know how I feel about Mercedes. I just feel she's like the best female wrestler on the planet. I just do, right? To each their own. And uh, we each are, have our own prerogative way of thinking. But I put them on a pedestal. And to watch that match from this weekend, it was almost like that's not Mercedes. That's not Baker. Like, like when they got in the ring, you thought, oh, this is going to be it. 
And unfortunately, the backlash was swift, and it continues today on that match. And Nikki Bella went on to say recently, Nikki Garcia, she went on to recently say, uh, if you really want to watch a match and learn from it and be captivated by it, uh, you want to watch Mariah May, Tony Storm from the same car, that same event. Just totally overlooking the match that everybody was talking about. And she said, that's the match that you want to learn from. That's the one you want to see. So a lot of people were like, damn, man. (laughs) I got to say it like that. But she was given an honest take. That was the better match. So what, is she just not supposed to say something's better than the other just because the other was supposed to be better? But she took a little bit of heat from that. Jim Ross, right? Jim Ross also gave no Fs on this. Jim Ross recently talked about this match, Mercedes and Baker. And Ross goes, that should have went no no more than 10 minutes. That should have been a 10-minute match and out. He said a lot of times what happens is these wrestlers have a lot more pull, and so Tony gives them more time. The talent, this is what Jim Ross said. This is a slight paraphrase, nearly a quote. Jim Ross says, Most of the time, these talents believe that more time is what it's going to take to have a good match, and that's just not the case. Now, none of us want to see a two-minute match necessarily, right? But you don't always have to have 20. Some people should not be in there for 20. You can have a great match in 10 minutes, 12 minutes. But Jim Ross said that everybody today just wants the more time, not thinking like that could be a detriment. So when Mercedes and Baker was already off to a struggle, and then you give them more time... It was destined for disaster. And so Jim Ross is like, you know, they thought that they, that more time was going to help them. And the match in totality should have been no more than 10 minutes. When it was all said and done, 10 minutes was like the high peak. Jim Ross was not a fan of it, (laughs) but nobody was. But, you know, and that's telling what Jim Ross said, too. You know, a lot of these talents, they have stroke now, and they literally call their own shots. And it's not just Tony. Happens in WWE, too. It's been for years. The top names, for sure. But, you know, there's a lot more people that have control. And that's a lot of the backlash on Mercedes, that she has a lot of creative control. So she can ask for things, and Tony's kind of got his hands tied. But for somebody like Mercedes, you want to believe that Tony gives her more time out of respect. Like, this is Mercedes we're talking about. If she thinks that three more minutes is going to be valuable, we're going to give Mercedes three more minutes. And then there's Baker. If Baker asks for three, four, five more minutes, you know, all she's done for the company, maybe you feel obligated to give it to her. Or is this a case of Britt Baker having too big of a head, asking for more time, biting off more than she can chew? Baker does, and I put her up on a pedestal. But a lot of the disconnect, a lot of the reason fans don't like Baker as much is because there is that ego there. Maybe not as outwardly as Mercedes, but there's an ego there. And she truly feels and looks at herself as the female version of MJF in AEW. And that rubs people the wrong way. A lot of people in the industry and a lot of the fans AEW diehards, man. They're kind of like, ah, oh, Baker, we know what you've done for the company. <laughs> the head's getting a little big there. To call yourself the MJF of the women's division. But when Tony Khan has these two ladies, and you got the egos, and you feel like you do have to give them a little more, you're almost at their mercy, right? Like if they ask for five more minutes, eight more minutes, Tony's probably like, fine. And what happened was, Jim Ross is right. Unfortunately, it wasn't a good connection. It should have went 10 tops. Anyway, that's uh, so that was a little. So either way, even if Nikki isn't involved, and hopefully she isn't in this uh, domestic violence arrest of her husband, that's still, I mean, that's horrible. You know, her husband is arrested for domestic violence. And then she's kind of getting like ripped for her take on all in. I don't know. Wild. Uh, But Baker and Monet, you you know, the the backlash was so swift. Just one more quick minute on this. Mercedes, the backlash was so swift on this match and so harsh that Mercedes did something she never does. Mercedes actually, she does this column. I don't know what it's in. You guys can look it up yourself. But she writes this column either every month or every week. Uh, Maybe it's in like one of those online magazines, something like that. And in this column, she actually spoke about this match the negative response and admitted if she had it to do again she would do a lot of things different 
She says there's no use looking back, though, just looking forward and learning from that and doing things different in the future if they get another chance. She never speaks like that. I'm telling you guys. Uh, again, from the time this channel, we started covering pro wrestling on this channel, good, what, five, six years ago, something like that. We always put Mercedes, Sasha Banks at the time, up on this pedestal, and we reviewed her. The reviews on Mercedes were even more vivid because of the respect we put into her. So sometimes they were more harsh than others because it was Mercedes. But in those epic moments, in those wild matchups, the truly awesome matchups, man, we would praise it longer than anything else we were reviewing. So you get the, the good with the bad. But we, we put her up on that pedestal. I have never, in all of the years reviewing Mercedes, I have never heard her talk like that or even acknowledge the negative or the backlash. But she knew. That's how much pride she takes in her work. She knew that match, that should have been so much better. And I think she knows that it's, it's just, you know, all of the... The critiques of that match, it was just. I hope they do get another chance to rectify that. That's not their best. I doubt it very much. Guys, then, I know the story you really want to talk about. Netflix. Netflix doing Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Dirty. Um, so what are we talking about? Well, first of all, Netflix is going ahead with airing the Vince McMahon documentary titled Mr. McMahon. This was a project that was on its way. It was already greenlit by Netflix way before any accusations on Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Then um, all of the legalities came into play and Netflix put it on the shelf. At one point, we were told it is scrapped. It's done. Now, all of a sudden, we we're hearing not only was it relit, it got the green light again. We're hearing it's ready to be aired September 25th, less than a month away, guys. That is a Wednesday, Wednesday, September 25th. It's going to be in six one-hour uh, airings. So one hour apiece, six different episodes. Uh, the official release from Netflix uh, is as follows. This is from Netflix. Mr. McMahon, a doc series chronicling the rise and fall of the WWE controversial founder, debuting September 25th from Bill Simmons and Chris Smith, executive producer of Tiger King. I saw a tiger in a tiger saw man. You guys remember that? So that was a theme song from the show. Tiger King Netflix. Don't tell me you didn't see it. <laughs> so the director or executive producer of Tiger King is working on this. And of course, Bill Simmons is awesome. Bill Simmons, a massive, massive person in the sports world. But his passions are pro wrestling and, and MTV challenge. <laughs> that's Bill Simmons. So that's going to be a, a unique duo presenting this documentary series on Vince McMahon, Vincent Kennedy. It's called Mr. McMahon. And they're doing this, guys, just a few months before Netflix gets WWE. They're doing this during the whole sweep season when everybody has to now do all these interviews that's running shows anyway, that's running networks, whether broadcast, cable, streaming. So they know that starting in September and going straight through the holidays, man, Paul Levesque McMahon, Hunter Hearst Helmsley is going to be doing the most interviews he's ever done. This move to Netflix is going to require that. They're switching Fox's SmackDown over to USA. And this doc is going to chronicle all of the legalities. They have added it, guys. So they're going to be talking about everything that's happening with Vince. This is opening. It's open season on questions for Hunter Hearst Helmsley. On his father-in-law, Vince McMahon, which you know he does not want to talk about. He's been asked it, I think, twice since the legalities. And I think they were both at one of these little post-media scrums after the PLEs. And he has shut it down with the quickness. And he'll somehow, right, he's a good manipulator. So he'll, he'll leak it into like how business is booming and that's what we need to focus on. But he will not talk about how his father-in-law is doing or anything about that. Now, you're going to have people outside the wrestling world, right? You're going to have, and I'm not even just talking sports illustration. You're going to have the People magazine people. You're going to have Variety. 
entertainment tonight. You're going to have all these people, and they're going to want to know. And this time, you can't escape it. It's a documentary about your father-in-law. It's titled Mr. McMahon. It's not just his rise, right? It's not about how we put professional wrestling on the map globally. No, the literal title, right? The, the description states a doc series chronicling the rise and fall of the WWE controversial founder. He's going to have to answer all this. <laughs> it's about the doc. There's no way he can get it. So if you're at this presser, if you're at this presser for Netflix, right? Your, your show is going to Netflix. It's debuting in a few months. You think you're not going to be asked about the documentary that's also simultaneously going to Netflix about your father-in-law. They put, they put Hunter Hearst, they did this dude dirty. Let's be honest. They could have waited. There was no reason to pop this out for September because they know it's sweep season. They know everybody, the cable stations, the broadcast, they're all debuting their new shows. So the streaming services have to compete. So they're like, all right, you know, there's already buzz that WWE is coming over. If we can split this up into six different episodes, you know, this is a hot topic, man. We get the Vince, the Vince doc out. So, okay, well, what does that do for the guy running the company who happens to be the son-in-law? He's the one. It ain't going to be the, the Netflix executive answering all these questions. Hunter Hearst Helmsley now has to get his eye off the WWE ball and now focus on answering these questions about his father-in-law. Because that's what's going to happen. This is a huge documentary. So for the next month, that's going to be the, the, the big focus. Coming off of the documentary, that's when all the questions start arising, right? After everybody has seen, and, and you're going to hear a lot of things you didn't know. So the month after, all through October... Happy holidays, Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Netflix is giving you a gift. <laughs> They're probably already pissed off. They gave the company $5 billion, right? Buyer's remorse. They're waking up every morning like, why did we do that? <laughs> the numbers are not even against football comp. There's no NFL Monday Night Football, and their average is between 1.6 and 1.7. They're like, what do we do? $5 billion? Well, yeah, well, you're going to answer questions about your father-in-law now, buddy. <laughs> I do feel they did him a little dirty. You could have waited on this, man. Um, Post-WrestleMania is a good time, right? Get all that, bu right, right? Start off on Netflix on the right foot. You know, don't let people look at WWE like this tarnished company because people are going to do that now with this Vince McMahon doc. You know, don't tarnish that. Let let your run go a little bit. Have WrestleMania season. Get everybody buzzing. And then right around there, right after would be nice. But maybe around Mania, then put it out there, right? Where it can kind of get a little bit lost in the shuffle for Hunter Hearst Helmsley. But this is wild, man. They did him a little dirty here. A lot dirty. They're going to put this thing on a few months before they debut. That's wild, man. I don't even know if they gave Hunter a heads up. <laughs> They're just going to do this. Again, I repeat, from what we are hearing, it is everything that happened within the last couple of years. And sure enough, their description says the rise and fall. So the reason they shelved it wasn't just because of the controversy. They wanted to add more to it. They said, this is going to be juicy. This is the good stuff. This is what's going to sell this doc. It's going to be interesting to see the trailer. <clears throat> I'll tell you that much. But, uh, yep, Hunter, I don't think can escape those questions now. You know, this is La Familia, this is his family, this is his father-in-law. Uh, I think he's going to have to actually, like, start to, you know, say his piece on it. You know, there's only, <laughs> there's only so much silence you can give on the matter. This is your father-in-law. This is the guy who created the company. This You're going to answer questions at some point. Netflix is making sure of it. Guys, that's what I got for you, man. Uh, we could probably go another story or two, but um, time is a little short as of now. I do have a lot to... You know, there's a possibility there could be a second upload today. There's a short window. So maybe I can get another one or two of these stories and maybe another story or two. That's a maybe. I don't know. Subscribed and notified. You guys know the deal. You should be subbed and notified. Anyway, you'll be the first to know if something else goes up. Um, so I appreciate it, guys. Until next time. And there will be that next time. Possibly even later today. But until next time, there will be that next time. Top guys, we are out. BC in the unit saying, check you. Peace.